This is uh, the webinar, uh, the uh, luncheon interview with the U.S. Patent Commissioner. Um, for the record, since we're recording this and for later uh, viewing uh, uh, on the internet, for the record, we'll say that this is April, April 26, 2018. Uh, this is the uh, luncheon webinar at Ackerman LLP in our Washington office. <coughs> Ackerman's a general practice, the diversified law firm. We have uh, over 700 lawyers in 24 offices. Um, and we have a, a substantial IP group, which is why we're interested in this. Uh, I'm Stephen Glazier. I'm a partner here. Um, our speaker today is, uh, as you know, the uh, U.S. Patent Commissioner, uh, Andrew Hirschfeld. Uh, the... Uh, uh, has been at the patent office since 1994, where he started as a patent examiner. He's done a variety of jobs in the patent office, uh, and he uh, became a supervisory uh, patent examiner, and uh, later served in other roles, including he was a group director of the Technology Center 2100 for computer architecture and software. Became <coughs> he became the uh, Patent Commissioner in 2015 uh, and is in effect in that role. He's the Chief Operating Officer of uh, uh, the, U the U.S. Patent Office, who's intimately involved in the uh, operations and executions at the Patent Office. He has a, a B.S. Uh, from the University of Vermont and a J.D. from the Western New England College uh, School of Law. Uh, so he's a lawyer and an engineer and a very experienced uh, patent office official, so he's a, a great person to listen to. Um, uh, I, I will give you the, uh, the, the podium here, and uh, he's going to make opening remarks uh, on uh, current developments at the patent office of interest, and then we will go into a uh, Q&A question and answer session where we're going to run over some uh, questions that we have gotten in advance uh, from the uh, audience on uh, topics of interest today in the patent community. Thank you very much. I very much appreciate you having me here. I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Um, what I will do, uh, as you just heard Stephen say, is I'll, I'll give a, uh, some opening remarks, but I'd like to keep uh, what I say brief so we can get to questions. I know a number of questions were submitted in, in advance. Uh, I'd like to spend the bulk of the time discussing those. Um, let me start uh, by, by saying um, uh, we have a new, uh, new boss at the USPTO, uh, you know, Director uh, of the USPTO and Undersecretary of Commerce, Andre Yanku, uh, has been in position for uh, just over two months now, about two and a half months, and it has been an absolute pleasure to work with him. And uh, what I'd like to do is, is outline some of his vision and the things that he is, is uh, focused on, and then I'll get into a little bit of a PTO at a glance, and then I will uh, we'll turn it back over uh, just so we can start the questions and answers. Um, let me start by saying that, that uh, Andre Yanku really has um, two main sort of foundational areas of, of, of particular focus. Uh, one of those is making sure that, that we all uh, involved in, in the patent space are having a very positive discussion uh, and pro-IP, pro-patent discussion uh, about uh, all, all of patents uh, and the issuance of patents. Um, he does, you know, it's very important that, that we don't lose sight of the I'm going to use his exact words here, um, the, the, the brilliance of, of, invent, of inventions, and, and the, uh, we want to get it exactly right, the brilliance of inventions and the excitement of invention uh, is a phrase that, that he recently used in a speech. And, and he, he's always constantly reminding all of us uh, at the PTO and in the public uh, to keep that in, our, in, the, in the forefront of our minds as we continue to go forward. He's really trying to change the, the, the dialogue on IP to a much more positive message. Now, that's certainly not to say there aren't challenges, there aren't um, issues that need to be addressed. We obviously, uh, the patent prosecution is a very complex system. There will always be challenges, and there are challenges now, um, but we should not lose sight of the positive. And I, I think that's a wonderful message. And um, I can tell from my position as commissioner, as I meet people, uh, I can really tell that that's, that's, that's having a positive impact. I really see, we really see that. Um, another area, that, that a foundational area that he's very focused on is how to interject as much certainty and reliability 
into the patent grant as possible. And um, in other words, when somebody gets a patent, we want to know that it's valid, that it's going to withstand challenges, that they can use that patent to make the right decisions on and, and, and minimize the, the concern that they have that that, that patent would be overturned. Um, and so we are, we are very focused on what we can do um, to, at the office to, to help um, increase reliability and certainty in the patent grant. Obviously, the, the main role that I have is I oversee um, all the examiners, the patent examiners, and so that, uh, that prosecution, very important to us to make sure that we're doing our job correctly um, and that, that we are, 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 are proceeding with uh, certainty and, and reliability. Some areas uh, within that um, that he's particularly focused on um, are, are one, uh, subject matter eligibility, and I'm, I'm sure we'll have further discussion uh, about that uh, shortly, um, but, but certainly uh, we, we've recently issued a, a memo to examiners on, on a recent case, Berkheimer, uh, that came out, and we are currently looking at all of the guidelines that we've issued to see what, if anything, can we do differently um, than we have in the past. We have a, a more of a body of case law now, uh, so we are taking a relook to see how can we add certainty um, and reliability. I think we could all recognize that uh, this, there's been recent court cases in the subject matter eligibility area. Um, these certainly have added some, some confusion and some challenges, and so we're trying to, to redouble efforts to see what we can do to, to try to address that. Um, another area uh, that he's focused in, uh, particularly for, for me, uh, since I oversee uh, the examiners, is the examiner search. Um, and making sure that the, that the best uh, prior art is in front of the examiner, that when they're making patentability decisions, um, they, they're making the best decision, the most educated decision that, that they can make. So we're looking at a whole host of ways to uh, enhance uh, getting art in front of the examiner, ranging from uh, potential use of artificial intelligence as a pre-search, so that an examiner, when they first get a case, even before they look at it and search it, there has been some search done in it, and it gives them a, a running start, so to speak, when they have the case to anything we might be able to do operationally to uh, increase the search. Uh, so that is another area uh, that we're focused on. And uh, while it's not in my direct purview at PTO, uh, certainly Director Yanku is, is very focused uh, on, on the PTAB, more particularly the uh, AIA trials uh, where, where patents can be challenged. Uh, there has been a number of, uh, you know, uh, significant discussion about uh, potential changes uh, to the PTAB, what, if anything, um, should be done. And I know he's very focused in that particular area. Um, while I'm discussing uh, PTAB, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the two Supreme Court cases uh, that came out this week. It's not often you have a week with two Supreme Court cases uh, on, on patent law, um, but, but we did have two, uh, two court cases earlier. Um, one of those was oil states. Uh, that was a case dealing with whether or not these AIA trials um, were constitutional. The, the Supreme Court did hold seven to two uh, that they are constitutional. The other um, case was, was uh, SAS or SAS, uh, and that was dealing with the issue of whether the PTAB could have partial institutions. In other words, if there was a petition to um, challenge a, a, a certain number of claims that they can institute on less than what was in the uh, or a subset of what was in the petition instead of all. Um, what they have been doing is a by claim and um, by issue, um, and now it's all or none, and, and there was a 5-4 decision that the petition should really stand or fall together. Uh, where we are with those is, is of course, uh, with, with, with staff, there is going to take some changes uh, that we need to, to, to make at PTO, and we are um, taking next steps for that. and. Um, making sure we're, we're familiar with all the nuances of the decision and determining how to move forward. Uh, I'd like to mention um, that Chief Judge Rushke, uh, he's the Chief Judge of, of the PTAB, he will be holding a webinar uh, on, on Monday at noon uh, that is open to anybody from the public, uh, and, and he will be addressing these cases uh, in more detail. Um, if anybody has questions that you would like to um, submit to me, you can certainly email them to me, and I will make sure to forward them um, over to him so that they can be addressed um, uh, potentially in the webinar, or at least uh, PTAB is aware of some of the concerns or issues that, that, that people uh, would like to bring up. 
So I'll uh, transition a little bit to just give you a, a high-level overview of, of PTO, and then uh, Stephen, we can get right to the, the questions sure. and answers. Right. Um, but, but the PTO, at a, at a glance, or at least the, the, the whole Patent and Trademark Office is about 13 people, uh, in uh, 13,000 people, excuse me, within the Patent and Trademark Office. <laughs> A little understated there. Um, in the patents organization, which is what I oversee, uh, we have about 10,000 of the 13,000 people. Uh, that includes uh, 8,200, just over 8,200 patent examiners. Um, so that is, of course, the, the bulk of the staff. Um, to give a, 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 a round number of the number of filings that we receive in a year, um, we have about 450,000 uh, new cases being filed a year. These, these are not um, uh, continue, you know, like requests for continuation cases. Um, these would be just new cases. When you add in the request for continuations, you actually get about 600,000 uh, cases that are filed per year. But new cases are about 450,000 a year. I've heard many people ask about filing rates, and um, there seems to be this feeling that filing rates are dropping off and, and people are not filing in the U.S. and um, that is really not, uh, not an accurate statement. So right now for this uh, fiscal year, we are about a 3% increase in the filings of new cases as compared to last year. Uh, that is actually a higher percentage increase uh, than we were expecting. Uh, the last few years have been somewhere around a 1% increase compared to the previous year, so that the 3% is a, is a much uh, larger number. It doesn't sound like a lot, but when you do the math, it is a lot of cases uh, that are being filed. Um, just historically, because uh, again, I know people ask about this uh, very often, historically, um, in the last 20 years, we've only had one year where the filings, um, the amount of filings uh, decreased, and that was 2009, the financial crisis at that time. All the other years have been an increase in filings from the previous year. Um, where people get confused is, is when we add in the request for continuation um, and you have a total number. That number is decreasing, but we actually look at that as a good thing. Um, request for continuation, request for continued examination is rework. Some cases we do want to minimize that, so it's actually good that those are dropping. But brand new cases um, have been increasing and, and decreasing um, essentially every so with that, I'm ready to uh, just to dive into any of the questions. Cool. Um, you mentioned the, the rate of filing new cases. Do you have a feel offhand um, for how the split between U.S. origin and foreign origin is going? Is that? Uh, I, I, I I don't have um, an exact uh, percentage, but but uh, I, the majority of the filings um, are are from U.S. applicants. Um, so, so the increase is certainly, at least in major part, to the U.S. U.S. filers. Yeah, I contrast that with the trademark side, where, where trademarks are having bigger increases, um, but they're primarily from, I think, the majority from China. Really? Well, the whole different issue, yes. <laughs> okay, let's go to some of the uh, questions that we got from the audience, and. Uh, um, Pretty interesting. Uh, the first one here is uh, the PTO. Uh, is the PTO working on new guidance for examination regarding Section 101 and patent eligible subject matter, uh, with a, a, a goal to have a, a clear definition of abstract idea? Oops, there we go. Our screen. We got to wiggle our mouse once in a while. The screen goes dead. Uh, with uh, with an idea to establish a clear definition of abstract idea directed to an abstract idea and something more, uh, which are famous uh, undefined key terms in the Alice Mayo test from the Supreme Court. And if uh, you're, you're working on these guidances, when do you think you may have them published? You may have gave us some information on that. Sure. Your remark. Sure. I, I, I did give some. Um, what we, what, let me just uh, address what came out um, last week, uh, and then I can address the question with more specificity. What, what came out last week was in response to a Federal Circuit case um, called Berkheimer, 
which, which uh, and I, I don't want to get too, too weedy on that, but basically held that the, the conclusion of whether um, additional elements in a claim is really the, the step two um, in, in the Alice Mayo framework is, um, is conventional or well known, that that's a question of fact. And that's not the way that the USPTO was, was treating that. So we did just recently come out with a memo to all examiners on this. We also, uh, on the same time, came out with a Federal Register notice, uh, which, which basically takes the language of the memo, adds it, puts it in the Federal Register notice, and then has a, a, a comment period for the public to, to provide us feedback. Um, what, what we tried to do in this memo is, is to keep the, the goals that, that I articulated earlier of certainty and reliability in mind. So we were, we were, uh, as, you know, we were very clear on, on what steps an examiner can take and how they're going to evaluate this issue of well-known or conventionality um, so that everybody um, is, is on the same playing field and understands how we're proceeding forward. And I'm looking forward to, to getting more input from, uh, from people during the, the comment period. Um, and, which is something we've, we've done in the past comment period. I think that will be very helpful. Um, so uh, on the, to the question, um, that memo does uh, not address um, abstract ideas or, or the direct to, uh, as was asked in the question, that is only one portion of subject matter eligibility. Um, we are currently looking at uh, our our, gui our guidelines and considering these exact issues that are raised in the question. Um, we, we certainly are working on um, the directed to how can we make that more reliable and repeatable in an examiner's decision um, so that there's, there's less gray area um, than, than there is today. And we are also considering of whether we can, um, being consistent with, with, with all the case law, uh, come up with a, a, a better um, or even a definition of an abstract idea. So these are all issues that we're considering. Um, the question also asks time. Unfortunately, I, I don't have, uh, I can't give you a, a, a time. I think that these are um, obviously challenging issues which we're working through. Um, depending on, on what we end up with, we could, we could you know, come out with them right away. We could decide to do a comment period before they go to examiners or have them go to examiners and concurrently do a comment period, all kinds of ways forward. Um, and these are the exact issues we're, we're working on uh, now. So uh, suffice it to say, uh, I can't share a time because I don't know the time yet, um, but we are very, uh, that is, that is uh, on my plate, I, I think, right now, um, at, right at the top of, of the things that I'm focused on with others at, at USP. That will be very popular when it comes around. It'll be a big hit. Uh, a question: um, Would you consider uh, possibly uh, a definition of direct to that if um, if the claims do not preempt all possible embodiments of the abstract idea, so that you could implement the abstract idea outside of the claims, that is not directed to uh, the abstract idea, but to a more specific subset of it. So preemption has, has been um, something that, that even the, the courts have written about. It's, it's, it's um, an approach that we've, we've often discussed. So the, the short answer to the question is, of course, we're considering um, every path forward. Preemption is one of them. Um, I will tell you that personally, I, 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 um, every claim is preemptive to a, to a certain degree. That, that, that's, that's the intent of the claim. Um, it's a very fine line of how you define preemption, so I think there's challenges there, but that's not to say it's not something um, that should be considered, and we are basically looking at everything and trying to take a fresh approach and say, what can be done? So um, we are looking at preemption as, as, as well as any other approach we think will be, um, will be helpful. Great, great. Um, next question here. Uh, will the PTO publish new guidance for claim construction for the office, perhaps to drop the BRI test, broadest reasonable interpretation, in favor of the Phillips versus AWH test uh, used in the federal courts, uh, which is often summarized as the ordinary and customary meaning, where uh, primary use is made of intrinsic sources and uh, extrinsic sources and expert testimony of you as only secondary? 
this is an issue um, currently being discussed about whether the uh, PTAB for their trials, uh, whether they should be using the, the, the BRI standard or the Phillips standard. And I, I think you'll, you'll, right now it's, it's in the discussion phases and I'm hoping, um, you know, relatively shortly in, in months we'll, we'll, we'll be out with, um, with, with the approach that we would like to take as far as Examination goes. Um, I, I, there, this is uh, the issue about changing to Phillips is really a non-issue uh, for patent examination. So that's the examiner in the first instance. Um, our plan is definitely to continue with the broadest reasonable interpretation. The issue about Phillips arises at the at the PTAB for their trial. I know that's something that um, Andre Yanku and, and um, David Rushkey are, are considering right now. And, Stay tuned and, and, and as their discussions continue. Okay, so later this year we'll see probably something on that. I don't know the exact time. Trying to pin you. Okay, let's uh, try another question here. Uh, what are the average allowance rates? We're going to a whole new subject. Here. What are the average allowance rates for software enabled applications in Tech Center 3600? versus the average allowance rates for software-enabled applications and other tech centers such as 2600 or 2100. So we, we, don't, um, we, we don't track allowance rates per se by um, software-enabled and that, that phrase. Uh, so what I can give you is, is approximate allowance rates. Um, I, I can obviously get more detail, but just from my head. Um, can give you approximate uh, allowance rates in the different technology centers. Um, so in the business methods area, which we do we do track, even though they're in part of a larger technology center, we do track them separately. And that will include some software enabled and some not. Um, they are uh, somewhere around a 15% allowance rate. And uh, the other, overall at USPTO, let me even give that number, where we're just over 50% allowance rate in cases. Again, the business methods, um, it's about a 15% allowance rate. And then in areas like 2600, um, which is dealing more with computer graphics and computer interfaces, they are, um, I believe, even higher than the average. I think they're about a 60% allowance rate. Interesting. Um, what is the process to assign a patent app? to an art unit. Uh, who does this? Is it done by software with keyword searches or by human readers or mobile? Um, my understanding, and I think we actually have a contractor in the room here who does this, so he can probably give more detail, but I think it's a, a combination of both. Um, we, we, we have um, contractors who handle the initial classification. Um, I believe some of that is, is done by machines and some of that is done by, by people. And it's something we're always evaluating to see how we can improve. Um, if I may, I'll just go over the whole process. Sure. Right? So, so once a case gets its initial classification, um, it is sent over to, to that particular art area that handles that, that case. The, at the point of receipt, it's then looked at to see if it's in the right location. Um, and, and if it's not, if it's in the right location, then, then they would obviously keep it and then assign it to an examiner um, at, when that time comes. Uh, if it's not in the right place, uh, then it would be up to the receiving area to then uh, start a transfer process to send it to, to a different uh, location. Then there's even a third step. When the examiner gets into the case, uh, he or she will look at it and they may say, this is not my case uh, for whatever reasons. It should go someplace else. And they can also institute a transfer process. Um, uh, at that point, though, it's, they really need to find somebody. They would need to talk to an examiner who um, they believe it is their case and have that discussion, and, and they will have to work it out where it should, where it should go. Um, so that, that's the high level. Um, a related question. Uh, 
if an application is allocated to an examiner with an allowance rate that's low, say 1%, in an R unit with a low allowance rate or single digits, how can the applicant get the application transferred to an examiner in R <laughs> <laughs> with an allowance rate closer to the PTO average? And uh, can the R unit designation in the uh, examiner designation be appealed by the applicant? The, the, um, the answer is yes, right? Um, you can uh, question whether the case uh, file a petition um, to, to have it reconsidered whether the case is in the right area. Um, I will tell you that uh, not all the time, of course, but, but most of the time I believe those petitions are, are not fruitful because we do take great care to make sure that the, that the right case um, gets to the right examiner who handles, um, who handles that technology. The, the, the premise behind the question um, I'd like to address a little bit because the, I hear very often, and I, and I, I, I don't know from you reading the question, Stephen, but um, I hear very often that people um, believe that, that different areas of the office should all have the same allowance rates or should all be at the average, right? If our average is, you know, just over 50, then everybody should be that way. And really what controls the, the destination of the case is really the subject matter of the case itself. And then what's going to control the, the allowability of the case is also that subject matter. So if you're in an area, um, let's say if you're in the financial area of business methods, which the Supreme Court has spoken on, um, as being a, a, a difficult place for eligibility, um, those examiners are going to have a very low allowance rate um, as opposed to if you are in, say, to use the example that came up before, 2600, where there's you know, computer graphics and more technology-based type of inventions um, as compared to business methods, they will have higher allowance rates. So it's um, the premise that a case can just go to a different examiner um, is something I, I, I don't agree with because it has to be an examiner who is versed in that particular technology and, and, uh, and that art, um, not just any, anybody from any place. Do you find it uh, is a, a clear dividing line or a gray area to dividing uh, uh, applications between, say, uh, business method and um, software technology? I, I do. I, I, I think I think that there are um, there are areas of overlap. I think there is gray area. What you know? What is software? What is a business method? Um, when is something considered technological? For example, um, and and what what we do when we classify cases is we try to to get um, to the bottom and, and 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 best align it. Now, while there's gray areas. Um, when you look at the subject matter of, say, business methods versus, you know, either 20, you know, the subject matter of 2100 computer architecture, 2600, or, or any of the other TCs, as a whole, they're very, very different. Are there going to be subsets where there's more similarities? Of course there are, um, but, but certainly to look at um, allowance rates overall and say this TC has one allowance rate, so it's, you know, doing a better or worse job than this other TC is, is um, just on a, on a premise that I don't I don't agree with. What we do at USPTO is we do look for uh, we do uh, analyses of, of everybody's uh, works that, that they do, right? So we, what we do is we have statistical analysis of examiners, um, and we know you know who's allowing you know we can look at anything. Are you allowing on the first action more than your 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 peers? Are you allowing um, you know? more second often office action non-finals. We can track everything and look at that. Where we have areas of overlap, we do look um, and evaluate consistency and, and make sure examiners are being consistent. Um, but again, to look at two technology centers is, is far different from looking at you know, two particular sub-areas that, that might be similar. Um, I also have um, very often had people tell me, hey, these two cases are the same and they went to different technology centers, one allowed them and one rejected them, and when we dive into it, we, we say, no, they really were, were actually very different, and 
that's why they went to different technology centers um, because the, 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 the subject matter was very different um, in the way it was claimed. Does a lot of that go to the claims as they're drafted? Oh, it does. Yes. yes. The yes. claim is the name of the game. Yeah, you're actually asking a confusing question because right now we're in the middle of two different classification systems, but in the U.S. classification system, uh, it's all about the claim, and, and, uh, and an updated classification and the spec is, is involved also. <laughs> There's never an easy answer. That one. I can't catch you. <laughs> um, okay, uh, another question here. With, again, uh, this is a group of questions, uh, sure. related themes. Uh, we get a, a lot of this kind of stuff. We filter it out some of the redundant ones. Um, uh, <laughs> this question is interesting. Is it a failure of due process for an application to be assigned to an art unit with an allowance rate of less than 10% since rejection is essentially determined prior to examination of the merits? And uh, two, uh, where the application uh, may have uh, a chance of success as closer to the average at the uh, patent office <coughs> assigned to an art, uh, an average art unit um, with overlapping subject matter. I, to 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 re repeat a little bit of what I said earlier, the the subject matter of the case determines where it goes. Right. So. And, and, and it also will be the determining factor in whether or not it's, it's, it's allowable. So the, the whole idea, if we were to take a, um, a case that wasn't allowable or is allowable in one technology center is, it, is that it would be handled um, the same way in another technology center. I think when people are comparing um, different technology centers and looking at allowance rates, um, to me they're drawing a conclusion that's, that's um, a somewhat faulty premise, that, that all the subject matter is the same, and that's, right. that's really not true. So the case has to go to the place that it can be examined best with the, where it fits best based on its subject matter. Um, so I, I personally don't see any, any concern about that. And if you're in a, in a financial area of business methods, it's going to be the same group of people who are going to examine those cases. Likely going to be a, a very low allowance rate as compared to, to other areas, just, just to give, give one example. So, in a, in a, a case law context with Alice, that had, certainly has a differential impact in different technologies. Uh, Absolutely. That then uh, you, would ex, you would expect the result would be that different art units and different technology centers would have a differential impact because yes. Alice will affect some and not others at all. That's correct. And, and what we do is we will look at um, all the examiners within any art unit and compare all of their statistics to their, to their similarly situated colleagues. So we can, we can see for in an art unit if anybody's an outlier. So, mm -hmm. so let's take if you had an art unit with, um, you know, everyone had a 50% allowance rate and somebody has, one person has a 20 or one person has an 80, right? They obviously are an outlier. Now, the question is, why are they an outlier? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? We don't know. But what we'll do is we'll identify them as an outlier, and then we'll look at their cases and say, you know, are you doing something better or worse? Are you doing something different? Do we need to have, you know, training? Uh, and that, so that's the approach we take. Um, but again, comparing to technology center to technology center is a challenge. But looking within pockets of similar areas is, is really where we can get the, the, the best comparison between the centers. Right. Right. Historically, if you have an outlier, what's the result? Training, or so it could it could he, take he trains you or do you train him? <laughs> well, you're right. It could be either because an outlier doesn't necessarily mean bad work. It just means different work, and so that different can be good or bad. Um, so so we'll we'll take a look at that. If we were to determine um, that an outlier has best practices and that does happen, and I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, sometimes we have. You know, we see somebody as an outlier, and, and they're an outlier because their 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 allowance rate is higher than others. And when we look at their work, they're they're much more proactive than others about seeking allowable subject matter, making suggestions, getting you know on the phone and calling. And to me, that's best practices, and that's something we would we would 
certainly want others to use as well. On the flip side, if we see that somebody is um, you know, rejecting things that shouldn't be rejecting or, or never reaching out to the applicant, or, um, we, we can address that through training. Um, you know, it, it really depends on what you find, right? So if you find, if you find say, practices which aren't great but aren't wrong, right, that's a different issue. That's coaching and mentoring. If you find things that are wrong, it's coaching and mentoring and training and maybe evaluation of more work to make sure that, that, that we have a good handle on what that person is doing. We really use that as an indicator. Yeah. We also make all these stats available to every examiner. So they, they can look at these stats and know how they compare to their colleagues. Do you, uh, you don't follow, you say you don't follow allowance rates. Do you, is there, you follow the number of patents <coughs> that are allowed uh, by examiner, like monthly Ooh, we or do. quarterly? We, we do. So we, we don't, we, we don't, um, I, I'm not so sure, I, I'm not so sure we said we don't follow allowance rates, right? So we, we do look at allowance rates. But we don't have goals for allowance rate. We don't say that, you know, any examiner should or shouldn't allow something. Um, we don't say that as an office we want a certain allowance rate. We let that just be a result of, of normal examination. What we do look at is if somebody is an outlier responsive to their similarly situated peers. And that could be based on anything, allowance rate, the number of actions, um, you name it, we can, we can track it. So those of you familiar with the pair, anything that's in pair, we can track and, and, and monitor that. Do you yeah. look at the number of appeals or the number of uh, reversals on, a, on an appeal for an examiner? We do. Um, it's it's not as um, fruitful as, as we all would hope. Um, most examiners, uh, when, when you do the math of the number of appeals and the number of examiners, most examiners will have, you know, a one or two appeal cases. And then when the when the you know PTAB gets to that case and decides it, it's years after the fact. And so take even subject matter eligibility, the laws have changed <laughs> very often. So we do we do look at um, reversals uh, and affirmances and use that information for what it teaches us. Um, oftentimes, however, it, 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 the teaching is, is not fruitful or, or, or out of date. But we look at that because there might be good gems in there. That will help us feedback and, and improve what the examiner does. What, what we also look at is you know, things like um, how often do you go to, say, um, pre-appeal, right? And because that's more timely than the whole appeal process. So you can look at you know, pre-appeal conferences and, and you know, do you have an examiner that, that always reopens after pre-appeal or, or always allows after pre-appeal and that doesn't go to the, to the PTAB or, or not. And look at all those types. How are you compared to your peers? Um, okay, well, this is, next question, which I think we touched on in, in answering a previous one, but I'll, I'll go ahead and throw it out here in case you have anything else to say. When an applicant, when an application's art unit is changed after the official filing receipt, but before the first office action, uh, what process or criteria people are involved in this change? That's your three steps. Sure, that would be that would get right to the three steps. So that could have been from the examiner when they looked at the case, and, and as they got into it, they thought, okay, this this isn't mine, um, and and they found somebody that uh, was a better fit for that application. Um, it, it, so anyway, any part of the, the three process. So will the art unit on the official filing receipt be the art unit that the contract the classification contractors develop? Or has it gone through uh, uh, step two with the first examiner? Yeah. No, I, I believe, and um, I'm not, I will tell you I'm not 100% sure about this, but I believe that the art unit from the initial classification is what goes on the filing receipt. Right. Because that all happens very quickly yeah. in time. And so that you wouldn't have, yeah, you wouldn't have the time to bring in the rest of the process. But right. Right. Yeah, this is, uh, another question that's interesting. I think you, you touched on this. Um, are some art units in Tech Center 3600 instructed by PTO management to reject uh, the most uh, applications on the ground of Section 101 and Alice? Uh, no, nobody is instructed to to reject you know cases um, unless somebody you know has made the determination to look at a claim and say that that should be rejected, right? So there's no 
there's no um, high level instructions that say if you're in this area or that area, you, you reject most or all of what you have. We certainly don't do that at all. Um, as a matter of fact, what we are doing is the opposite, particularly in the business methods area where, where we've been spending a lot of focus on um, trying to have examiners be more proactive in finding eligible and allowable subject matter so that if they believe that you know, the claims as written are not uh, patentable but there's patentable subject matter in the case that they'll be more proactive and, and reach out. So we try to do the opposite, we try to foster um, the allowance of cases, um, but certainly we, we, we do not um, instruct uh, that, that you know, blanket rejection should take place and, and nor do we shoot towards any allowance rate. I think that's a great process. I think all applicants love to get a call from the examiner. I am a huge fan of, of interviews. Uh -huh. um, I always say, you know, in real estate, it's location, 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 and patent prosecution should be interview, interview, interview. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of getting together with um, the, you know, the, the, the attorney or agent and you know, potentially the inventor, uh, of course, up to whoever's representing that person, um, with the examiner and having that discussion. I will tell you, I've, I've, seen, I've seen this process from all sides, including many years as an examiner, a first-line supervisor, and, and now in the, my current role and, and previous roles, I get to talk to a lot of people. Very often there's disagreement where if, if, if the folks involved would just sit down together, <laughs> they can figure something out um, or realize why they disagree and, and, and really see how to move forward in a productive way. So um, to me, I, I, would, I would be pushing interview practice uh, as much as we can. Um, I also like to, to push um, video conferencing because I, I think there's all there's it's, it's sort of the untapped world um, that that we that we can we can explore right now. Uh, primarily, all of our interview requests are coming in for phone telephonic interviews. Um, if you interview over video conferencing, you can see the examiner. Um, you can amend documents right in real time. You can share documents. Uh, we even have staff on hand to help from a technological standpoint, not only the examiner, but any practitioner's one. Every technology center has somebody that you can call and say, hey, I can't connect. How do I connect? Great. What uh, platforms do you use for video conferencing? We, the WebEx uh, guy? It is um, primarily WebEx right now, um, but, but it, there is um, some use of Skype also. One thing we've started recently, um, and this is this is done for interviews uh, that use a certain form to sign up, uh, um, it's called our, our applicant initiated request form, and our interview, uh, our applicant, yeah, application interview request form. Sorry. And once, if you use that form to sign up, um, what we end up doing after the interview is sending a survey to the examiner and to the um, attorney who interviewed the case, and that's so we can get some feedback ranging from anything about the interview itself to the technological connection uh, that took place to the assistance you got setting up uh, you know, WebEx or um, Skype. Or, so it's really, I think, a very helpful uh, helpful step. We just recently started that, and um, I hope to, to, to be able to expand that. So you can specifically request uh, a video interview. That's great. You can. So one of, one of the benefits that we, we have at the office, if you use the, um, the form that I was talking about, and you can find this right on our, our website. But if you use that, um, we will know what type of interview you requested. Um, when you do that, it goes to the examiner. The examiner will get back to you within two days. Um, but we know, you know the timing of the interview. We know what type was, was requested, and we know um, what the interview took place. We've often heard from some that I wanted a video conferencing. My examiner didn't want to do that. This is a good way for us to help keep tabs on is that is that occurring or not. Um, and the form is also a, a, a automatic a, a agreement to use internet authorization for back and forth for setting up the interview, um, and, and I think that's helpful. And then again, it triggers triggers a survey as well. After the interview. cool, that, that's great with the video interviews. We've found the interviews to be very helpful. Um, they, they save time and money and you get a better result and it, it must make life easier for the examiner too. It must save them work. I mean, I'm thinking it saves them work. I think so too. It does. 
if they can cut out a couple of office action cycles, right. great for them. Yep. But uh, with, uh, as there's more hoteling, we've had a harder time doing face to face. Uh, the video thing is uh, great. We'll try it. We'll do it. I, I think that's uh, great. I would like to get my clients to video more. There, there's some. Uh, we have some videos on our website of the video conferencing capabilities. Yeah. And they're really helpful. They really show you what you can do. So videos to tell you about video. Now with WebEx, you can do like uh, video uh, conference calls, right? Yeah, from, from absolutely. From different, three to four to multiple locations. Absolutely. You don't have to be in two sites. Correct. Just like you. Uh, yeah. So I don't. I don't know if Skype is there yet, but it's uh, that's good. I think Skype can do Skype audio. Can, I think but, you can. Uh, right. So so I, can, I I I have routine interviews. Um, not interviews, but discussions with examiners, meetings with examiners will all have, you know, ten people in the room and ten people on the web, and I've got ten different connections. They're all they're all located in different parts of the country, and extremely productive. In, in web, all, in, all in web. Cool. Yeah. Great. Great. No time delay. Once you get over the hurdle of learning how to set it up, it's very easy. Yeah, it's a little. There's a learning curve. Yeah. Well, you get a more complicated result, so you got to have a more complicated yeah. interface. Right? That's good. Um, okay, another question here. Oh, this is, this is an interesting question. Um, it's kind of long. Some surveys indicate that uh, about 15% of examiners issue about 80% of all patents, and that these examiners tend to be primary. And about 80% of examiners issue close to zero patents per year. This may be an exaggeration. Um, and that these examiners tend to be assistant examiners without signature authority. If, if, if an application is assigned to a junior examiner with no signature authority with an allowance rate close to zero in single digits, how may the applicant appeal this and get a new examiner with a, a new examination with a primary with a material allowance rate closer to the, to the average? There's a lot in that question. <laughs> um, I, I, I started to write down some of the numbers, and, I, and so I don't think I have them all, but I will. those numbers are way off base. Um, so I, if, I think you referred to a study. If whoever asked the question wants to send me the study, I'd be happy to have people take a look at that study. Um, but I will tell you, um, and, I, and again, I don't know the exact numbers of the question, but there is no way that 15% of the examiners are issuing 80 percent um, of, of the cases. Um, as I said, you, we, we, we overall have an allowance rate of about um, just over 50 percent. Uh, there is a range, of course, and that range is based on the particular technology that someone examines. You know, I'm sure there's, you know, low, like we said, in business methods, um, there, you know, and, and, and even within business methods, there's ranges also, right? If you get towards say something that's a court has spoken on directly, you'll, you'll be um, less chance uh, to much higher. Um, we have about, um, let's see, it's about between 85 and 90 percent um, of, our, of our examiners uh, have over a 25 percent um, allowance rate. So I can tell you that the numbers um, read off in the question are, are, are not, are not entirely correct. Um, it's a very, very small percentage um, of people who have the low allowance rates that are discussed in that in the question. Uh, again, you know, limited to the areas that are are directly you know Im implicated by a Supreme Court uh, case holding something to be not patent eligible. They, they're, they're straight in the Alice bullseye. Yeah. I, you know, the, the question really raises the bigger issue about about statistical use um, and and again uh, we use statistics at PTO so I'm not going to say statistics aren't helpful and, and shouldn't be used um, but I would be very careful having statistics about a particular examiner or even art unit because I've seen them when they're accurate but I've seen them when they're way off base um, when people started to use that I actually was involved in some calls with, with you know bloggers and people who wrote about allowance rates to explain why what they had was not accurate, 
Um, and again, I'm not saying they're all not accurate. Sometimes they are, and sometimes we've seen that, that they're not. Um, you know, one example is I've seen somebody, I saw, you know, something written about an examiner who stopped allowing one day, you know, this is the, the allegation that all of a sudden they, something, well, something went wrong with them and they just decided they're not going to allow. But what happened is they, they changed jobs, right, so they weren't an examiner anymore. Um, and so it's, it's things like that and that there's, there's sometimes explanations behind changes. But regardless, what's, what's behind the, the question, um, uh, I feel comfortable in saying primaries uh, probably have a slightly higher allowance rate than juniors. Um, I think primaries have more freedom. I, I think as, as a junior examiner, this is something we've been aware of, aware of um, forever, that it, it, um, you know, it, it's, it's a challenging job. And as they're learning, we know there's a slight difference. Um, so we're always trying to be cognizant of that. But, but there's, uh, there's much more consistency across the office than, than in the premise of the question. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's, a, it's an extremely challenging job. Um, uh, it uh, definitely is, I recall, I think this, it was the first Supreme Court patent case said something about how uh, uh, writing a claim in a patent is the toughest job a lawyer would ever have because you're trying to define the, the boundaries of uh, intangible property. And you can't just send a surveyor out and measure it. And I, thought it was, I, I think it's, I mean, it's true. You know, so what we all do, right, we're all in this together, right. what we all do is incredibly rewarding, right? Going back to the, the brilliant inventors and the brilliance of invention, um, it's just fantastic, you know, what we can accomplish in patent law and what those great inventors have done for society. Um, that being said, an attorney's job of drafting a claim and an examiner's job of evaluating a claim are very challenging um, and, and, and very critical because if you don't get it right, you know, you, you don't allow something that should have or you allow something that shouldn't have or you, uh, or the scope is not what, what somebody was entitled to. These are all problems we, we want to avoid. Um, so it's, it's uh, finding the Goldilocks approach, Goldilocks approach of getting it right. Um, and that gets, that gets, you know, right back to, to what we can do at USPTO to, to reevaluate our training and our focus. Uh, yeah. Um, we found in looking at some of the studies, I can't, you know, I have no idea how accurate they are, but one thing we found was that, um, that it's hard to be, they're not comparable because the, the way they can calculate the allowance rate, mm -hmm. uh, it seems intuitively simple, but in fact, when you, you, you got to deal with the numbers and it's complicated, specifically, how do you deal with parents, continuations, CIPs, divisionals, RCEs, they all have different serial numbers. How, how these are counted is, 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 there's no intuitively obvious correct one way to right. do it, so everybody does it a different way. And a lot of times the studies are kind of vague about just what they did. And uh, so you, in the end, you really don't know, it's difficult to know exactly what they're counting. And it's, I think it's inherent in the complicated procedure of a family. I mean, is the family one at, is it one is it one application or what? Is one specification and maybe half a dozen patents? Uh, well, you know, it, and it makes I don't know if there's ever going to be a good answer to that. But it's uh, it's, a, it's just, a, but there's a very interesting question. Everybody wants to know. Yeah, we have we have wants. seen um, studies that we agree with the analysis. And albeit their numbers are different from ours because they did it in a different way. So we think the numbers were accurate. They just calculated something differently from what we did. So, right. Um, and again, that just that just creates right, right, right. Inevitable. Um, another question. We have some uh, a few more minutes. Uh, yeah, you touched on this earlier. Uh, how many examiners are there? Uh, Eighty-two hundred. How many? are assistant examiners with no signature authority? How many are primaries? And how many art units are there? All right, so let's see. I can note here. You know, when in doubt, count, right? There, there, there are um, uh, more than half are primary examiners. So out of the 8,200, you are, you're probably around the 4,200 or more um, as primary examiners. So just, just more than half are primary examiners. Um, and again, I don't, I don't know the exact numbers offhand, but, but that's, that's uh, I feel comfortable. That's a very um, close number. Um, by the way, uh, the 
average experience of the examination core is 10.7 years. Really? Yeah. We have, we have um, 130 examiners who have more than 30 years or 30 to 40 years of experience. How um, many? Uh, 130. Wow. And then we, we even have, uh, I've been told from a recent look, uh, two examiners who have over 50 years of experience wow. as examiners, which is just a, a mind-boggling number. Um, so, uh, getting back to the question, so it's 8,200 um, examiners. Um, the other part of the question, I'm sorry, I'm not remembering quite. I think was the number of art units. Yeah, how many art units? There, there's there's uh, well over 500 different art units um, that we have now. Now that gets to be um, some art units we have like uh, are the combination of different technologies with multiple supervisors, and some are smaller. Um, but, but suffice it to say, there's somewhere around 500 uh, different technology art units that, that, that cases um, can go to. So you can see it's uh, very extensive. Is yeah. there anything, what else was in the question? No, I, I, I think there's oh, uh, how many primaries, how many assistants? Yeah, I that's, guess that's so, right. So the, the flip side of either yeah. primary or a, or a junior. Yeah, just, junior. Just under half for the junior examiners. Uh, Boy, that's a lot of. What, one, of the, what, one of the things we're looking at um, is, is uh, whether or not the examiners have the correct amount of time to do their job. Uh, the average examiner, uh, and this is an average, and there's people way on either side of this, so, so keep, please keep that in mind, but the average time for an examiner um, from start to finish of a case is just over 22 hours. Uh, and again, it's, they range up into the you know, low 30s, um, to, to in the, in the mid-teens, I think. So we are taking a look to see if examiners have the right time um, and what, if anything, should be done there. And that's a, that's a big, um, big undertaking with, with 500 different technologies. Um, every technology has uh, assigned to it a, a production time. So every examiner has a, you know, when you have a case, you have a certain amount of time to do that case. On average, so you distinguish by technology. We, we distinguish, distinguish by, by technology, right? and so um, you know it, it, it gets challenging because easier technologies, right? easier to understand technologies, don't necessarily mean easier prosecution, right? It could actually be harder prosecution. The searches could be longer. Um, uh, you know, if it's a crowded crowded area, crowded art. Um, you know, the, the changes will be smaller, so the searching can be more challenging, the prosecution more challenging. Um, so, but these are, this is something we are undertaking, uh, which you know, has, has um, I think, big ramifications potentially. Right? If, if, yeah. you, if you change, I mean, you can, you can do the math yourself, right? But if everyone gets 22 hours, if you added an hour, you know, it's about four and a half percent uh, change in processing power. Wow. Yeah. But it's important to, 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 to get it right and to, to make sure people do have the right amount of time. And, and right. Otherwise, we're, we're shortchanging our numbers. Right, right, right. It's a great statistic. Uh, another question here, interesting. How many Track 1 applications uh, uh, were filed last year, last fiscal year, 2017? Track 1. Tra track 1 applications um, in, in uh, 2017 were somewhere around the 9,000 range. We were just under 10,000, I believe, in 2016, and the number decreased a little bit. The irony is we have a cap of 10,000, and, and that was really, I will tell you, that was a number, it was just a guesstimate when, when the AIA was put into place, and we really peaked just under that number, um, and then last year went down slightly. Uh, we expected the decline. As our, our, we're working off our, our inventory of cases and tendencies are getting shorter, we expect less people to use track one. Uh, so not, not much of a surprise for us. But the, uh, right now, the track one cases are, um, or last year, were, were around the 9,000 number. Uh, and it's, I, I routinely hear, um, including today before we started the WebEx, positive feedback about the track one either um, which we were able to, to examine. So it's about a 12-month time frame from the time you're file all the way up to a final disposition, um, which is just fantastic. Wow. If you need it, 
it's fabulous. For example, if you have an M&A deal or, or, or equity financing that's dependent on your patent position, right. and you're waiting for the money for the patent, yeah. it's fabulous. Yeah, and it's, it's a good deal. That, that it's cheap, too. Yeah. But uh, it's just not relevant for most cases, which is fine, because you're, you're letting uh, the demand dictate where you put the resources to accelerate things. You're not accelerating something where, you know, who cares, right? We can wait two years. Do you happen to have a, a feel off the top of your head? I didn't ask you for the statistics. What the average pendency is of not track one? Or sure. Like so so the, 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 the – I said it was going down. It is going down. Uh, it's going down significantly since the, you know, the last seven years or so. Mm -hmm. We're about, on average, 15 months to a first action and about 24 months for total prosecution. Um, that number is decreasing. Uh, with the filing rate that I said um, was a little higher, you know, two percentage points higher than what we expected. Again, it's we're hovering around 3%, and we expected it to be around 1% to be consistent with prior years. Uh, that will – I'm – this is a problem I want to have because we want more filings and it's, you know, because it's great that people are being inventive and, and, and using the, the patent system. Um, so this is not a bad problem for America. Um, but with the more filings that come in, the harder it is, of course, for us to maintain the pendencies. Um, so so that, that's the catch-22 uh, to that particular issue. But, but again, uh, about 15 months and then, and then two years uh, for total pendency. What, what we'd actually... Uh, are starting a focus on more than in the past is um, patent term adjustment time frame. So if rather than saying let's have an average first action and an average total pendency, which is I've been at the PTO for 24 years, it's always been the measure. What I'd like to focus on, um, in, you know, either in, in addition to or, or instead of the, the, those pendencies I just mentioned would be patent time adjustment time frame. So by statute, we have 14 months to do a first action four months to work on an amendment, you know, to the 14, 4, 4, 4, 36, for those of you familiar with it, 36 would be the, the total issuance of a patent. Um, that is what I'd like to focus on because I think that is what adds the most certainty into the system, that rather than have an average with some areas higher and lower, let's get the highest percentage we can within those patent term adjustments so we're not awarding patent term adjustments because of PTO delay. Basically, you want to get the term adjustment to zero. Correct. Correct. And I think, you know, any, any right now with an average of 15, you could be somewhere that's hovering around 10 or 11. You could be somewhere in the, you know, in the 17, 18 range. So if we're focused more on the aggregate number, I think that's, that's also helps us good. Yeah. Well, I just, uh, anecdotally, it does seem like we're getting that last few years less adjustments. Just right. Less term and, and as, as down, are, right. As we're not we, getting the hundreds right. of the hundreds. So of as days. our pendencies are coming down, that that's that will be the, the effect. And right now, we we the, the challenging <coughs> one of those numbers, right, the fourteen four 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 thirty six, is the is the first action in fourteen months. As I said, our, our average is about fifteen months. So obviously, we're, we're missing a lot of the fourteen month um, cases. And when we can get that lower, the rest. A couple more questions here, sure. and we'll wrap this up. Um, well, they're, they're asking here, uh, compared to 2017, how many track ones were in 2016? And uh, the follow-up is, what percentage of, of the 2016s are now allowed, and what was the average time to the issuance? I think they're going to the, the, the pendency of track one. How much right. bang do you get out of the buck? So, so the track one pendency from the time of filing to, to issuance, um, or final, you know, we call final disposition of the case is just about a year. Um, the goal, uh, sorry if I get too, too weedy on this, the goal is a year from the time of the petition decision. Um, so we're, we're well within that. It's about um, eight or nine months from the petition decision and then, uh, again, a year um, overall. Uh, as far as the allowance rate, I know I hear anecdotally people feel there's a higher allowance rate, but I, I think it's... Um, I don't know offhand exactly. I think the last time I knew it was slightly higher than the regular, than, than the non-track one cases, um, which I think makes sense to me because you have, I don't think they're being examined uh, differently. They're certainly not examined differently, different standards. It's all the same standard, but these are cases that people 
have identified as being extra important. Uh, so I think the prosecution is more focused on uh, as they come in as they come into the office. We get that subjective impression, of not measurable, but it's like people are just on more. It is true for the applicant too. Well, if you're going to pay yeah. extra and you're going to, but I, I want to. Yeah, yeah. Everybody just like they had an extra cup of coffee. <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, one other question here, which came in uh, later. Uh, I think this was in response. I'm looking to see if I have the exact allowance rate, but I don't know if I do. Sure. But anyway, I can listen to your question as I peek over okay. here. Yeah. Uh, I didn't mean to pop a statistics question. No, that's okay. I, I know there's so many of them, you can't be expected <laughs> to walk around with your okay. head all the time. Um, this came in. This is an interesting question. I think this was reacting to one of the, the reports this week uh, that so much was happening in Tatton's. Is, is the PTO considering changes in quality measures? You begin to touch on this. Does the commissioner think that hard data such as reversals at the board uh, should be used as part of these uh, quality statistics? Kind of got into this. We, we did. Um, we got into some of that, right? We got into the, 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 the you know, board decisions, whether they're the AIA trials or ex parte trials. Again, I, I'll just, I want to reiterate that, but, but there's a much bigger um, part to the question. We do believe that the board, what the board does um, should be looked at and should be evaluated, um, and, and we are doing that. Again, there's differing levels as to how useful some of that is Laws could have changed in the time frame, and it's a small subset for any particular examiner. But we do look at that for any teaching point. Um, what we also do, though, uh, is have very um, extensive uh, quality review and quality metrics, and we can speak for the next few hours on that. We have a separate staff that that that, that does random reviews um, of cases in process. Um, they, they historically have taken in process. In process, so they'll take you know right after a first office action from the examiner. Sometimes they'll take second actions. They'll take allowances, finals. We take a little bit of everything. What we're starting to do, um, and this is actually getting getting to part of the question, we're starting to do, and we're starting to do is to get is to to we're looking at whether we can take cases um, right after say an examiner's answer is written, um, because that would give us more real time feedback from a quality review standpoint. And even waiting for, for the PTAB. PTAB will be helpful, but it'll be, you know, some delay when they get to the case. This would be evaluating it as as, as it comes up to us. Something we're considering. Um, I won't get the examiner's answer up for an appeal. Yeah, an okay. appeal. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. Appeal correct. Yeah. Um, and I and I don't want to to, to to get too weedy in this, but one of the areas that I've been really focused on in the last you know, two and a half years since I became commissioner is the way we evaluate quality, and what the examiners do. Um, suffice it to say, in, in my opinion, we, we've historically uh, done reviews that there was a lot of, uh, there wasn't a lot of reliability, I mean, reliability is not the right word, there, the, the reviewers themselves would determine if prosecution was inhibited for an error or not. In other words, if they, if they thought, well, what the examiner did wasn't uh, entirely correct, but it didn't impact prosecution, they might say it was not an error. I'm trying to simplify that way down just say we have statutes and so our measure of correctness is statutory compliance. So we've, we've really changed uh, the way we review all applications on a per claim basis. Is it consistent with the statutory determinations that we need to make? Yes or no, it doesn't matter if anybody believes it impacted or didn't impact prosecution, just that were you right in your decision making or not. Um, that that's uh, doesn't sound like a significant change necessarily, but, but it's, it's changing a process decades and decades for thousands of examiners. Uh, we have revamped uh, the way we, we do that. I think that's helpful. Great. It puts us more in line of reviewing a case the way an attorney would look at an, an examiner's office action and say, hey, to an attorney, you know, if you have to respond to a rejection and that prosecution that, that you don't think is right, then that prosecution has been in, impeded. <laughs> and so um, we want it to be more consistent with the way the public Great. That's great. How have the examiners reacted to this? 
I, I think fine. I mean, you know, obviously any change is, is change and, and can be difficult. And I, I think just, I think people get it. They understand it. It, it. it makes sense. We have statutes and we just need to evaluate a correct or not under the statute. And it's, it's, it's more nuanced than that though, right? I mean, there's where we get into to, to some questions is, um, you know, there's a certain notice function in, in, the, in the statutes, right? I mean, you, it's okay to make the right decision, but you have to convey that and how much of the conveyance is you know, considered proper or not proper, and that's where it gets a little challenging and gray. Um, but I think we, we're working our way through those issues. I think it will be a much more productive uh, approach than what we've done previously. Great. Great. I have uh, I've received a message that we're out of time, so we got to get off the air. I want to thank you for it's coming out. Thank you very much. It's been very interesting. It. Uh, and you're, it, you're continuing the great patent office tradition of being totally uh, uh, open and candid and transparent, which I think is a tremendous help to the whole patent community. Thank you. And uh, uh, it provides a, a, a great product for the public and helps us all together promote science and the useful arts. So uh, thanks for coming out. It's really pleasure. appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks Thank for, you very much for having me.